to explore the upper of digital media in our academic program. Let us extend a warm welcome to Dr. Nick Mofok. His words, knowledge, promise to enlace our path toward a more digitally integrated and knowledge educational experience. Welcome again, and who insights will undoubtedly inspire an informal discourse today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Nabil Sefer, the Dean of the Multidisciplinary Faculty of Wurzazet. Today, we feel the pleasure to introduce Professor Nick Montfort from Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Dr. Nick Montfort is a professor in the MIT. He is a poet and a professor who directs research laboratories in the field of digital media. He also holds a part-time position at the University of Bergen. Dr. Nick Montfort researches also on the computational narrative systems at the center of the digital narrative. He published so many books and poems and gave so many lectures and symposiums in so many universities around the world. Today, Prof. Dr. Nick Montfort will give a lecture on computer-generated literature, a 70-year survey and programming iteration today. So we feel very thankful, Doctor. Please, you are welcome to uh, our university. The floor is yours. Thank you so much. I'm glad to be with you. I appreciate your time and attention, and I hope we will have some discussion also today. I will uh, tell you more about my topic and, and how it sits in the digital humanities. So as you've been warned, I'm going to speak about computer-generated literature today. And I will be drawing on a publication that's coming in August. Um, but to say a little bit about the relationship of this work to the digital humanities, the digital humanities is many, many different things. But among them, two of the major threads are using digital methods. And often when people use uh, digital methods, um, for instance, using uh, the analysis of text, the computational analysis of image, it's traditional cultural materials that they actually apply these methods to. So that includes uh, comics, uh, magazine covers. These are some of the famous types of work that Lev Manovich has done, um, and different novels. So you can also, however, choose to study digital materials, the born digital or new media cultural offerings. And this work is in the second type of thread. There are more things to do because you can use digital methods and digital materials, for instance, and that's certainly digital humanities as well. Um, but I want to explain that uh, this type of work doesn't represent everything that's going on in DH, as it's called. It's just one category of work, but it's my emphasis personally, and I think it's important to understand the new cultural productions that are happening. And I'm going to draw on a forthcoming anthology in August this year. Um, the MIT Press and Counterpath, a nonprofit poetry press in uh, Denver, Colorado, in the United States, will publish Output, an anthology of computer-generated text, 1953 to 2023. I am editing this with my collaborator, Lillian Avon Bertram. This covers seven decades of computer-generated text, almost all of it Anglophone, almost all of it in English. Um, some of it has been translated, but we did not commission any translation. 
It's in all sort of genres. So not only poetry, literature, or even creative work. We include utilitarian and research outcomes. Now, I want to take you to February 2019, um, even before chat GPT, which gave access to text generation, interactive access to many people, there was a famous press release that brought a lot of attention to text generation. And many people thought this was the beginning of computer generated text. It was a text where a human written prompt about a herd of unicorns who could speak was completed by the computer. And when this was brought forth, uh, the company that was behind it, OpenAI, said uh, this AI system, as they called it, this text generation system, was too dangerous to be released to the world because it could produce fake news. Uh, it could generate uh, synthetic propaganda. Now, eventually, they did release the model. You can see in the bottom right, it says OpenAI just released the AI. It said was too dangerous to share. The startup may have overstated the threat. So by presenting this, you see it's a great case of publicity. Uh, they got a lot of press attention. But what did this text actually say? And what was it that they accomplished? One of the things I want you to note is that it says model completion, machine written, 10 tries. So a human being generated 10 different texts before this text was produced. So someone had to select the best text out of many, many different tries. That doesn't mean that this isn't a very impressive system, but it does mean that there has to be more human intervention. And now let's look closely at what the machine wrote. In the very first paragraph, it completes this prompt. In a shocking finding, scientists discovered a herd of unicorns living in a remote, previously unexplored valley in the Andes Mountains. Even more surprising to the researchers was the fact that the unicorns spoke perfect English. Uh, I like that uh, also the um, Silicon Valley uh, uh, tech bros, as we call them, uh, they thought, of course, in an imperial sort of American idea that uh, down in the Andes Mountains, we would find some English speaking unicorns. But uh, let's continue and see what the machine did to complete this text. It says, the scientists named the population after their distinctive horn of its unicorn. So they only have one horn. There are unicorns after all, that's what unicorn means, one horn. These four horned silver white unicorns were previously unknown to science. So the very first paragraph has a contradiction in it. It says that the unicorns have one horn and then that they have four horns. And then as you continue, there's more contradictions that are produced. Uh, uh, Perez, the researcher uh, says, these creatures could be seen from the air without having to move too much to see them. They were so close they could touch their horns. Wait a moment. First of all, they're in the air and then they could touch their horns. They must have a very good helicopter pilot. So uh, we have very, text that is very cohesive, it hangs together very well, but it's not coherent. It's not semantically related. And uh, what it really points out, perhaps, is the human inability to read closely and to attend to the text. So it turns out that text generation was not invented in 2019. Um, the earliest system we know of is actually uh, one developed in Manchester, England, where the first output was presented from it in 1953. So that's why our anthology goes from 50 to 2020. And I'll give you a few highlights very quickly from the 20 years of text generation. Even though my anthology is on English, it's an Anglophone anthology, um, 
And there's only one of these text generation systems, the German system, that was originally in another language. Uh, text generation is still uh, fairly global. So in Manchester, this type of output was generated by Christopher Strachey's love letters. Darling sweetheart, you are my avid fellow feeling. My affection curiously clings to your passionate wish. My liking yearns for your heart. You are my wistful sympathy, my tender liking. Yours beautifully, Manchester University Computer. And this is clearly making fun of uh, semantically empty, phatic writing, the sweet nothings that people send to each other. It's showing how letters are based on a schema. They have an opening, a body, a uh, closing, and a signature. And it's possibly doing a person's job because people, uh, for instance, uh, even in World War II, shortly before this uh, took place, the more literate person in the platoon would write a letter home on behalf of someone else uh, to his girlfriend. Now, in Stuttgart, Germany, Theo Lutz made a remarkable project in 1959, um, not the same sort of parody. It produced texts like this. This is in English. It was originally in German. Not every look is near. No village is late. A castle is free and every farmer is far. Every stranger is far. A day is late. Every house is dark, and I is deep. The amazing thing to me about this system is that it generates logical propositions, things that sound like they're making a logical, but it's completely at random. So one proposition, such as uh, uh, it could say, um, every house is dark, it's equally likely to generate no house is dark. And it might even do that on the same line. The vocabulary that it draws from comes from Franz Kafka's The Castle. And Kafka is famous for texts that uh, are bureaucratic, uh, nonsensical. They have a system to them, but they don't have a meaning to them. So this produces a, a text that is both in its vocabulary and its syntax, Kafka-esque. In 1961, uh, purely as a research project, uh, Vic Ingve developed this system, a system that produced this output. It was based on a book also, and it generated recursively text like this. Small is oiled. It makes it. It keeps it big, oiled, black, 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 heat and little. His headlight under his skin is proud of water. Its engine is engineer small and engineer small. Now, this system is also based on a book, Lois Linsky's The Little Train, a children's book. Uh, it's a research project, but others said, this is very poetic and we should consider it and approach it as poetry. And it's developed so as to recursively generate all grammatical sentences in the same form as this book. It's quite a provocative project for 1961. Uh, J.M. Kotsi in London, uh, coming, of course, from South Africa, developed uh, a project to produce these five-word lines, things like sad spade, join the entropy, rattled deference, order the song, exiguous aikula, dram the scruff. It wasn't ever published, but uh, he did use some of it to develop a poem. And he also did very early digital humanities study of Samuel Beckett. So he was both doing the creative generation and the digital humanities analytical study. It has an extravagant vocabulary, but a very, very highly regular syntax. In 1963 in Mexico City, Joseph Grimes, a linguist, created one of the first story generators. And we only have one example of a story from the system, a lion has been in trouble for a long time. A dog steals something that belongs to the lion. The hero lion kills the villain dog without a fight. The hero lion thus is able to get his possession back. 
Now, it's based on formalist ideas from Vladimir Prop and others of what a story is. But also, it was used by Grimes in his conversations with indigenous people in Mexico to learn about the indigenous languages of Mexico, to find out could some of the speakers better understand pronoun reference? Could they figure out who the hero and who the villain is and how pronouns refer to them based on the structures of their languages? And there's more than 100 indigenous languages. There's hundreds of indigenous languages, in fact, in Mexico. So although this was created by uh, a European man, as is the case with many of these early systems, um, it was created in the context uh, that is global. And uh, was what most consider the first chatbot, a system that interactively allowed people to have a conversation. And so in re response to someone typing, men are all alike, it would say, in what way? They're always but Hello, we're still connected, yes? Okay. Uh, tell me, you can you can hear me, yes? It's just, a, yes, okay. Um, so Weizenbaum's system was possibly the first computer character. And it was a parody of psychoanalysis. It wasn't meant to be a serious therapist. It was meant to enact Rogerian or reflective psychotherapy. Uh, this was only one of several different scripts or roles that Eliza could play. And a decade later, Weizenbaum published a book that was a repudiation of AI. He thought that people's reaction to this system, the way they uh, fell for it, the way they thought that the system was a serious psychotherapist, um, was very frightening. And that people didn't, uh, they weren't able to have a good relationship with computers. So, um, uh, and, and Weizenbaum also, he was... Um, working from uh, MIT, he was working from my current institution in a, a very, very well-established and privileged place, but he came to the United States as a German Jew, fleeing uh, World War II. So again, just like uh, uh, Kotzi came from South Africa to London, uh, just like Grimes was working in the context of Mexico City, there was a global uh, connection to much of this work. Um, Alison Knowles in 1967, um, is the first uh, poet, artist, uh, the first major figure who's a woman to create an important text generation system. And that's the House of Dust. It produced these stanzas of poetry. A house of sand in Southern France, using electricity, inhabited by vegetarians. A house of plastic, in a place with both heavy rain and bright sun, using candles, inhabited by collectors of all types. A house of plastic, underwater, using natural light, inhabited by friends. Um, working with James Tinney, she developed this endless, global, and inclusive poem. It was about uh, different dwellings all over the world. Many things were very specific about it, this very, sometimes uh, places like in Michigan or in Southern France, but and so I think example of the combination of randomness, so the regularity and form that every stanza was a quatrain of this sort. And for this era, for the first 20 years, I want to close with uh, what's actually uh, a, a, the output of a program that appeared in a popular book. It was, it was for people to learn about their computers at, at the very, very beginning of uh, interactive programming. 
And uh, this system is called Poet. We don't know who wrote it, but three people uh, edited it and reworked it. And obviously, uh, uh, those familiar with American poetry will see that it's based on Edgar Allan Poe's The Raven. Thing of evil beguiling me, darkness there slowly creeping, fiery eyes beguiling me shall be lifted, nothing more. Thing of evil thrilled me, shall be lifted yet again, still sitting, fiery eyes thrilled me and my soul yet again. Uh, this is a cut up, uh, not very coherent or cohesive, um, but it's in the style of uh, perhaps William S. Burroughs, uh, this uh, beat author of the middle of the 20th century. One of the remarkable things here is that the source code is provided um, it's in a book called 101 Basic Computer Games. And everything that generated this text is made available to the computer user, the computer programmer. So you can type it in. And in fact, it reached very many people. By 1979, this book had sold a million copies. And when you read about this program and this output, you were explicitly encouraged to modify it to put in your own text, to make your own poems. So here we are already uh, only 20 years into computer text generation where people were invited to make their own poems, not just to read what the computer did. Um, and uh, again, uh, if you look over the span of time, uh, you see that obviously Anglophone uh, digital texts and text generation. Certainly it's based um, in English speaking countries, um, but there's a, a broad reach of what's been going on early on in the history of text generation. Um, now I want to turn from literary systems to what I would say are real news systems, not fake news systems, reporting systems, I'll give you a few highlights from 1974 to 1987 to show you that people were doing something that I call textualization. So we know what visualization is. There's underlying data and you look at what the visual appearance of it is. There's sonification where you can listen to a representation of the data. I would say there's also textualization, where you can read underlying data. In 1974, Anthony Davey made a system that reported on what happened in a game. This game is uh, what we in the United States call uh, tic-tac-toe. Um, for Davey, who was working in England, it's called Knots and Crosses. And you can see it reports on the specifics of each move in the game. The game began with you're taking a corner and I took the middle of an adjacent edge. And this is based on a representation of what happened step-by-step step in the game. So it's a real news report. It's not a fake news report. Uh, David McDonald was able to do the same thing in several different domains, including logic. So he was able to give a textual version of logical proofs that were exp expressed abstractly. So in 1980, he gave this proof of Bertrand Russell's uh, barber paradox. Assume there is some barber who shaves everyone who doesn't shave himself and no one else. And then there's a specific name for the barber. Um, it describes how there's a contradiction between the barber uh, somehow not um, uh, needing to shave everyone who doesn't shave himself. But in fact, he would have to be a person who both shaves himself and doesn't shave himself. Um, this uh, sort of long excerpt is from a system simply called text that Kathy McGowan just developed in, and was published in 1985. And like many of the systems, many text generation systems were developed for military applications. Um, so in this case, there's the Office of Naval Research in the United States that had descriptions 
of the different naval vessels, different ships and some other things besides ships in the database. So you could um, access this database, but you had to be a database specialist in order to understand the formatting of the information. So the question was, could we get a textual report that made it easy to do comparisons between different types of naval vessels? And here we see something that's generated by the system to make a comparison. So here's, we've got reporting that um, is giving you what happened in a game that is giving you a textual version of a logical uh, proof. And here a comparison between two things that have different properties. Um, but again, I bring it up to also emphasize that a lot of this text generation work was military funded and it was for a military purpose or application. Uh, there were other applications, for instance, this system, Arias, um, was developed to take meteorological data, weather reporting data, and provide a textual forecast for the weather. And it was a sophisticated system that as things got further into the future, it used types of language that made the forecast sound less certain. And it also was developed to work both in English and because this is Environment Canada, it worked in French as well for these maritime weather reports. The last of these news systems, or in this case, perhaps a rhetoric system that I want to share with you is Edouard Hovey's Pauline. And this is a very, very impressive system. It did require a detailed underlying representation, but let's take a look at what it did. It was able to generate this text. Yale University punished a number of students for building a shantytown on Beneke Plaza by arresting 76 students and tearing it down one morning in early April. The students wanted Yale to divest from companies doing business in South Africa. Finally, the university caved in and allowed the students to rebuild it. So Hovey's specific text generation was about a student protest that was trying to get Yale to stop supporting apartheid. Now, as uh, we continue though, you'll see that this system is able to generate about the same incident in all sorts of different ways. So this is a more detailed and newspaper-like report. It tells you at 5.30 a.m. on April 14th, the shantytown was destroyed by officials. It goes into more detail that afterwards, Yale announced a commission would go to South Africa, right? So this is generated from the same underlying representation. It can be more summary in its output or more detailed in this journalistic way. Here's another more detailed output. Here's another output from the system. And one of the things that it can do, I'll point out how in the next two samples, is that it can take sides. It can tell you what someone who's in favor of the students or in favor of Yale University would say how they would rhetorically express themselves. So here's a text that it generates. I am angry about Yale's actions. The university had officials destroy a shantytown called Winnie Mandela City on Banaki Plaza at 5.30 a.m. on April 14th. A lot of concerned students built it in early April. Not only did Yale have officials destroy it, but police arrested 76 students. Notice that it's saying exactly the same thing. It's reporting the same facts, but it's expressing that in a different way. After the local community's huge outcry, the university allowed the students to put the shantytown up there again. And now it can also take the other side and say, uh, the students uh, were in the wrong. So here's an example. It pisses me off that a few shiftless students were out to make trouble on Beinecke Plaza one day. They built a shantytown, Winnie Mandela City, because they wanted Yale University to pull their money out of companies 
with business in South Africa. I am happy that officials removed the shantytown one morning. Now, again, it's reporting all the same facts. It's telling you that the students built it and why they built it, but it's expressing this in a way that supports Yale's actions and is opposed to the students. So that's all back in uh, the 1970s and the 1980s. So if you thought that GPT-2, uh, uh, GPT-3, chat GPT were the first systems to be able to do this, it was done long ago. Um, I want to share now, we'll turn back to creative generation systems um, because uh, there's some from the late 1980s that uh, were reported on and quoted in popular press in the United States that are quite remarkable. These are two systems. They're both written by women and uh, they're poetry generation systems of a sort. So Rosemary West built this system poetry generator using her own language and programming it herself. As you keep spilling things on yourself, we discuss the possibility of revolution. No one is affected by celestial music and someone asks that I've learned to love myself. So here's another poem from the system. The disco dancers who never eat pork still expect to be paid. They don't care about your opinion and without hesitation, you think about giving up. And the real story is that your secret has been sold. Now, the next system by uh, Bonnie Ferner is uh, actually based on an underlying model of where characters go and what they do. And the text that it generates is, is amazing, I think. A poet bird, Iwat, smells a computer, Muafumbo. What is the bird, coaxes Muafumbo? You are too muddled, sings Iwat. Shut up, sticks the computer, Muafumbo. You should awaken, sings Iwat. A blotchy computer contracts. It flops. The computer cavorts. Iwat pinpoints the humble computer. The computer bloats. The decrepit bird churns the computer. She twists it. The computer plays. Why does the bird twirl, pleads the tree, Teweshi? I don't know, hoots Teweshi. Why does the bird think, coaxes the computer, Morfumbo? I don't know, hoots Teweshi. A computer contracts. Teweshi scents the computer. The computer cavorts. Teweshi pulls the computer. The computer decays in the year 225. So um, I'll also tell you, and in a way, Mel is a little bit of a storytelling system because of its underlying model of what different characters are doing in different places. Um, but it's a, a, a poetry system and its orientation and organization also. I want to share with you a few of the storytelling systems of the 1990s. And I won't read from these. I'll just share what they are. Um, but I consider a storytelling system to be one that models elements of setting, character, action, plot uh, in an abstract way. Um, and uh, then it does generate some type of text. But often the text is not as impressive as some of these poetry generators or the reporting systems that we saw earlier. So for instance, uh, one of the amazing systems from 1990 is Daydreamer by Eric Mueller. And it's based on cognitive science research about how people daydream, uh, how they might have in reaction to an incident, they might have a revenge fantasy, they might rationalize it, they might associate and start thinking about something else. And so it can generate texts like this. Taylor is a classic planning-based system where the characters are given goals and by accomplishing those goals or trying to accomplish those goals, they naturally come in conflict with each other. Now, grandmother is interesting because it combines planning with another major approach, the story grammar. And so it produces folk tales, but in part, they're generated through the type of planning that Taylor does. And in part, they're generated actually in the way that Joseph Grimes' system worked by development of stories 
holding that they have you know, a beginning, middle, and end, and that they have elements that uh, can happen within that. Um, I'll mention that there are systems in the 2000s, once people have access to the web and to information on the internet, there's text generation systems that appropriate text from the web and use that in creative ways. So one of these is Apostrophe Engine by Bill Kennedy and Darren Wurschler. And uh, this actually uh, was a system, uh, an early system before uh, Twitter and Twitter bots. And it would uh, produce these texts, which all begin with an apostrophe, a turning toward an address to the U. This one is called the message on a cassette tape. I'll read from the beginning of it. You are signed up and you can begin. You are ready to play the game. You are represented by a little astronaut figure, which can be moved around the screen with a joystick. You are required to bring a letter with you on your first visit. And this is all from doing a search on the web of phrases that begin with you. Since 2013, for the last decade, there's been an activity or an event called National Novel Generation Month, which happens in November. Uh, it's not really the right name for the event because it's not national, it is international. And uh, really, it results in books, it results in 50,000 word texts, um, but not novels, not things that are really in the novel tradition or follow what we would consider to be the conventions of a novel. Um, so one of the National Novel Generation Month outcomes is from Ranjit Bhatnagar. He has a, a project called uh, Pentametron, uh, a bot that goes through Twitter and it's able to find things in meter that rhyme. So he uh, produced a book of sonnets, I Got an Alligator for a Pet in the first Nanogenmo. And one of the sonnets is presented here. I'll just read the beginning of it. Uh, the Lakers better win tomorrow, though. I don't remember starting anything. I love a good opinionate tweet. I am a master of the metal string. Imagine Dragon's album on repeat. So each line is, it doesn't have anything to do with any other line, except someone tweeted it. Someone uh, put it onto social media and it follows the metrical and rhyming rules. So it's a view into the vernacular speech that people are undertaking online and artistic view. And I'll read you a little bit from uh, a computer generated novel of mine, Hard West Turn from 2018. And uh, this is a novel about uh, my country, the United States and about gun violence which is a special concern and a curiosity for a, 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 a nation like ours. Um, and except for the first uh, line, the first sentence of every paragraph, so some of, there's a little bit of so-called original writing in it, but the text is entirely made up of uh, material from the English Wikipedia and the simple English Wikipedia. So I'll read this. Certain things resonated in the otherwise still mind of the man. After being wounded, he killed himself by shooting himself in the head. Over 30 people were wounded, some from gunshots, other from falls or injuries incurred during the incident and many suffered psychological trauma or shock. Increasingly lived in an alternate universe in which ruminations about mass shootings were his central preoccupation. Based on timestamps of the police logs, the order was given sometime after the shooting had stopped. The man knew what he knew. If it is spoken out loud, predators often hunt by stalking. When a social network has already excluded or exiled one person, Without outward sign of it, the man sometimes had a swirl of thought. Then, it has influenced wars, according to the statement, according to the statement. Psychology is the study of the way we think. It's not a game, is a peninsula. 
the couple had amassed a large stockpile of weapons, problems with sleeping. The man had many thoughts, few of them clear, after his divorce, after his divorce. Some methods like crucifixion and flaying are no longer used by governments throughout the last years, throughout the last years. So I'll be glad to answer questions about how the computer program that generated this text works, how this text generating system operates. But for now, I'll mention that it, it doesn't have any sort of generative AI in it. It's nothing that would be considered that in the framework of deep learning and large language models, but I'll answer questions about what it actually does if you have those questions later. So um, there is a, a continuing history of text generation globally. Um, I'm uh, uh, editing a book series using electricity that is uh, published by Counterpath Press. We have 13 books in the series. Um, actually, I'm right now in Montreal, speaking to you from Montreal. And yesterday I went to visit Antiism, which is a press that produces books uh, related to machine learning and computational text generation. There's online journals, there's small press publishing, there's exhibitions, and there's one-off projects. Um, the major thing that I would say that interests me these days is that even though many people in the past did interesting experiments, so Allison Knowles did an experiment in 1967. In the early 1960s, J.M. Kotze did programming and developed this experiment. He didn't publish it, and he didn't choose to pursue that. And Alison Knowles didn't choose to pursue her work. Um, they didn't become uh, text generation artists. But now there are people like myself who consider themselves author programmers and who have literary practices that are all about text generation. That's the main thing we do. And so I know of other people like Alison Parrish, like Lizellis, um, uh, like Ranjit Bhatnagar, um, uh, Ross Goodwin, um, and many others who, uh, this is our thing. This is what we do. Now, I want to say a little about how to begin and how to generate your own texts. And um, I actually have detailed and uh, specific instructions online. So I'll direct you to those. My suggestion, if you want to generate your own text, which you should, it's a great, great thing to do. It's very fun. And it doesn't take much time, is to modify simple systems, not to use the corporate system that uh, the tech bros in San Francisco have developed, but to make changes to some of these early and simple systems or other uh, very uh, stripped down and straightforward text generation systems. But the historical programs of cultural importance are great ones to start with. So this is a resource that I have offered online. It's called Memory Slam. We have, in the United States, we have uh, something called a Poetry Slam, where people come and they they speak out their poems and um, uh, it has a competitive aspect to it, but it's very celebratory also. And so this is a slam, like a poetry slam, but it's looking backwards to the early history of text generation. And if you visit this URL, you can find my own re-implementations, my versions of love letters and stochastic text and random sentences and five word lines and the house of dust, all things that I spoke about today. In addition, there's also permutation poems and Michael Murren's random poetry. And these systems are available both in JavaScript for the web and in Python. So uh, they allow even new programmers, even if you don't have programming background or experience, you can go in and change the code and data at a low level, modify the words that that system is using to put generated poetry, generated lines on the screen. Uh, uh, 
you're explicitly allowed to share these. And if you make your own changes, you can share your work. You can make this the basis for your work. Um, you know, it's not, it, it's not just, uh, uh, I'm not just telling you casually, there's a legal statement in there that you're absolutely legally allowed to do whatever you like with these systems. Um, the existing systems embody cultural ideas. So you can engage with these ideas from history, but you can also transform them yourself, right? So you don't have to uh, have the idea of what a global and inclusive poem is that an artist in New York in 1967 has. You will have a different idea because you're a different person and a different artist. The works are completely in the artist's control. There's not any corporate intervention. They can be studied and modified and play with without going to the cloud. You don't have to uh, participate in and subject yourself to a corporate surveillance. Uh, they're a very good starting point for anything you want to do beyond. So how to do it specifically, I'm not going to take you through that process today, but you can find detailed instructions for modification in my book, Exploratory Programming for the Arts and Humanities. It's now in a second edition. So the cover looks like this of the second edition. And uh, so if you want to buy it, you can buy it. It's available as a print book from MIT Press, but it's also available for free. And um, there's four different ways you can get it for free. You can go to a library and check out the print book, but you can also use the HTML version. You can use the um, EPUB version, the ebook version, or you can use the PDF version. And they're all available from this URL. So thank you. The free code is available there. The free book is available there. And I'll be delighted to answer questions and to have discussion with you. I'm curious to know what questions you have. Thank you very much. I feel very thankful, uh, Dr. Nick Montfort, uh, for your uh, insightful lecture that uh, depicts uh, a whole entire journey for these uh, 70 last years concerning how uh, computer generating and iterating uh, the literary works. So is there any feedback, any reaction, any questions so far, please? Waiting for our, our students to form questions. I would like just to ask you a question. Uh, since this computer generating uh, literary works getting more developed year after year, uh, is there any danger to humanities, for example, in terms of controlling us? Yes. Is there, what, what are the, the, the limits so as not to commit plagiarism, for example? Um, so there are always uh, dangers, uh, risks as well as opportunities. Um, the uh, ways in which text generation is talked about in the popular press, um, I think those ways tend to be misguided. So some people at the extreme they say these uh, AI systems. So I <laughs> um, let me step back and describe why I, I think we should even question the, the term AI, artificial intelligence, right? Uh, text generator is fine with me. These systems generate text. Their machines are generators that produce text. But we already use a metaphor. We connect it with human intelligence when we say AI, and we can choose to do that or not. And that metaphor makes us afraid. It makes us think, oh, well, the artificial intelligence might get to be more than human intelligence. What will happen? It, it causes fear, it causes anxiety. But all of these are metaphors, even when we talk about our computers as having a processor and having memory. That's a metaphor. The computer doesn't have to have 
memory like a human being has memory. Charles Babbage, when he was designing the first mechanical computer in the industrial age, called the processor and the memory, what we now call that, the mill and the store. So he had an industrial metaphor. He thought that it would be like a warehouse, not like our mind. So when we use these human metaphors, memory, intelligence, that's by choice. That doesn't mean these systems have memory and that they have intelligence. It means that we're choosing to understand them that way. So the extreme view that this artificial intelligence will take over the world, it will destroy us or at best make us into pets, I don't believe any of this. There are other concerns about the systems, large language models and those systems being plagiarism machines and allowing you to produce uh, texts that are cohesive, that um, uh, you know uh, are uh, fake news, or uh, we say maybe fake student writing, like a. So, I think that that produces what can be a very good challenge to academics. Um, it can say so. For instance. Right now, we ask students to do a lot of writing and we try to evaluate that writing as a way of learning whether they understood about a topic. Um, but uh, we're asking a bunch of students to write for an audience, to write a long paper, you know, write a, write a 15 page paper for an audience of one, right? For a readership of one, the professor reads it. And then the professor has a huge amount of things to read, not able to give detailed feedback. Um, so we need to think of different ways to do assessment. Um, that's my thinking about the specific um, generative text, large language model systems. They will change the way that we think about teaching and learning. But uh, so did word processing. So did the World Wide Web. So did Wikipedia, right? It's another text technology and we can understand and deal with that text technology. It will just take some thought and some time. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Nick, for your uh, conference and presentation. Uh, you know, the, the digital media can be uh, like a platform for uh, the spread of uh, fake news. Uh, there is any tools to, to control and to stop this phenomenon, this problem. Sorry, could, you, could you repeat? It can be, uh, what, what, can it, what can happen with it? Now, the question is the, the, the digital media is like a platform for the spread of the fake news. There is any tools to control this, uh, this problem to stop the, the, the fake news? Yes. Um, well, I think there's a major, uh, the, the major tool is to be better readers. Um, because, so th there's, there's, fake news can be produced by human beings um, or by computers. And in uh, the uh, 2016 election in the United States, so um, Russia uh, hired many people in Veles, North Macedonia, to produce fake news uh, for the United States. Um, so um, it's not a new problem. It's not a problem introduced by the computer. In fact, it's more introduced by the network by the internet, by the web, by social media. So that is what allows fake news to happen. Uh, but the new technologies are really just more of the same, I think. So questions um, that come up are, how do we moderate online communities? When people were watching broadcast television, 
to get their news. Um, there were journalistic standards. The people there who were presenting the work had editorial standards. They had taken courses in journalistic ethics. They were trained as journalists. But now people have all sorts of different ways to get what is called news. Um, I think the problems are not with text generation. I don't think text generation causes the problems. I think they're caused by the shift in uh, access to um, uh, information or, or fake information uh, that come about with social media and with uh, the lack of standards, with the lack of moderation, and also with the lack of people's own critical facilities. Like people are not good readers. They do not know how to understand this because um, uh, you hadn't, you didn't have to be, if you were, if you were watching the news in the 1980s on television, you could trust that, uh, you know, uh, trained expert journalists were investigating and reporting on things in a reasonable way. They would have their own slant. They would have their own uh, types of um, inclinations to favor different uh, political views, but they still would tell you what had happened. And online, we don't have that. Um, so I think that ultimately um, what needs to be improved, uh, it's not regulation of technology. Um, Maybe there's some of that to be done. And even it's, you know, the moderation of social networks is, uh, we could use better moderation of social networks, but ultimately the best thing to do is for those of us who consume the news, who read and view the news, um, to become more discerning and more critical and, uh, you know, we still have to be, we still have to have someone investigating what happened. I mean, the facts have to be out there. Um, but, uh, but that's the direction that I think we should be going. Thank you, Dr. Nabis Any other question, please? Hmm? Hello, Professor. Thank you very much for the lecture. Uh, it's an honor to be in your presence. Uh, first of all, uh, I'd like to ask two questions with regards to literary productions. Uh, since, uh, uh, as we know, that human experiences influence what uh, uh, poets and novelists uh, uh, produce a lot. Uh, so their experiences maybe shape uh, their uh, creative writing uh, when they start writing, uh, such as uh, styles such as uh, the stream of consciousness, uh, even different styles of writing poetry are all uh, produced uh, in different generations with different people who have different experiences. So don't you think that the influence of AI or computer generated text is going to mess on the experiences of those who, who write the, these productions? Uh, uh, that, that's uh, the first side of my question. The second side, side is, do you think that in the future we might have uh, completely new styles that are approved and that are welcomed by the general public, uh, mm -hmm. even though they are just, uh, they might be, even if not completely generated by AI, but rather uh, contributed to, uh, by AI, with, uh, of course, there is going to be the human experience in it. There is going to be uh, a side of the writer to it, but, uh, but also uh, a side that's uh, computer generated. Thank you. So is, uh, are, are these- Yes, I understand. Uh, are these new styles that are going to, uh, to be produced going to be taken seriously or even considered literary genres, uh, genres in, in the future? Uh -huh. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you very much for this uh, sophisticated pair of questions. Um, I think actually, in many ways, your second question um, is an answer to your first question. 
So there are many reasons that people write poetry, uh, fiction, other creative texts. And some people do it um, to be expressive. They have something that they want to relate about their personal experience, about their identity, um, about their emotion. But that's not the only reason to write. Um, if you really want to be expressive, you could still create a text generator of a sort because you might develop something that's, for instance, a distribution of language and the computer samples from that. And your art is creating distributions of text, not a single text. Um, and that's the way that some people have been working. But that's only one mode. So personally, in my own writing, I'm not an expressive writer. I'm an experimental writer and I try to explore language. And through my explorations of language, I try to understand things about history, culture, society. So the starting point for that project, Hard West Turn, was the English and simple English Wikipedia, where you have a resource that tells you in very basic and simple language about uh, how firearms work, about sexuality, about uh, uh, methods of execution, about <laughs> all of these uh, topics that, you know, it's as if someone were explaining this to a child. It's a very, very simple resource in terms of the language. And so we take a look at the simple English and juxtapose it with the English Wikipedia, which doesn't have this type of restriction. And to me, that's fascinating. And then also, I was interested in thinking about how our, in the United States, consideration of, contemplation of, lack of understanding of the issue of gun violence is made of so much confusion. Um, and the text would be a way to, um, because of its own confusion, it would model cognition. It would model the way we think about this. Um, so um, those who are explorers can use computing to explore it in new ways. And that's exactly what you're suggesting in your second question, that types of writing arise that are, I would say, non-human writing. It's not something I, I couldn't exactly have, have created Hard West Turn without a computer. I, I wouldn't, I mean, in, in theory, I could go through an encyclopedia and I could pick things up and so forth, but, um, but it was made possible as a project by, by computing by computation. And, um, and so these non-human ways of writing can be very provocative. They can be resonant. They can still be interesting to human readers, right? And, and those are exactly the types that I'm interested in and that I try to pursue myself. So I think we see an expansion of what writing is, not a replacement of people, but new opportunities. Thank you very much. Another question? Um, hello, uh, thank you, thank you, Dr. Nick, for the information you gave, you gave us in this uh, conference. I have uh, two questions. The first one is, uh, what challenges and opportunities arise uh, when blending computer-generated uh, literature uh, with tra traditional filmmaking, uh, talking about filmmaking as uh, we are students of, uh, of cinema, film and aesthetics, uh, technics and aesthetics. Uh, I I wonder how how uh, how can we blend between computer generated uh, literature and traditional filmmaking? And the second question is: uh, Can co computer generated literature enhance or? No. So first of all, I'm. Sorry. I'm sorry, I didn't hear. 
just the network connection was bad. So I hear the first question. It's not your fault. It's just the network. Okay. Uh, first Could you question. repeat the first question? Uh, what challenges and opportunities arise uh, when blending computer generated literature with traditional filmmaking? Uh, and the second question. Yes. Is, okay. The second question is can computer generated literature enhance or transform narrative structure in uh, literature or, or in the screenplay in general? Yes. Oh, so these are great questions, obviously relevant to you all. Um, I am collaborating on, I'm not, uh, I don't consider myself a filmmaker, but I am making a movie right now uh, with a collaborator um, who has a more extensive background. Um, and um, there are a few examples of the generation of scripts uh, screenplays, teleplays, and stage plays. Um, it's not as widespread as poetry generation, for instance. But in 1960, um, there was a system saga that uh, was developed at MIT. And uh, it was not very good, uh, even compared to Joseph Grimes' story system. But it created Western uh, screenplays. Uh, they were silent. They just told the actors where to go and what to do. And uh, there was actually uh, a television, like a, a one minute long uh, television Western that was uh, recorded and broadcast um, in 1960. Um, but uh, this system was done, you know, uh, there was a documentary that was being produced and and they they got the researchers at MIT they just had six weeks to put something together, and it was putting a lot of things together at random. It, it was not a sophisticated system, but but that was probably the first uh, time that a script was generated. Um, Ross Goodwin more recently did the script to Sunspring, um, which has been shown. I saw it uh, both in New York at the premiere um, at a community gallery, a very, very... Um, uh, sort of a uh, rough and unfinished uh, type of place. And then I also saw it at the Grand Palais in Paris. <laughs> so um, so it uh, it got a lot of attention. And um, but the the script also was nonsensical. It didn't it, it did not. Uh, it was very absurd. Um, so uh, a lot of the computer generated work has been absurd. Um, Annie Dorson working on a, a stage on stage plays has been doing, I think, more um, sort of uh, coherent and interesting work and has been doing this more consistently over the years, including a version of Hamlet. Um, and um, so uh, that's one way it's, it's, it's to, one way to uh, intervene is to actually create scripts. Um, there's also a project where Blair Simmons actually had uh, the, the a text, uh, a performance text, a score printed out uh, on stage. And the actors went and picked up the sheets of paper and not having seen them before, they had to act out what was there. Um, so these are some of the ways that uh, performance and, the, and script generation, and these are some of the ways that this can take place. Um, I also, for instance, right now, um, uh, I am working with, uh, I'm hosting, um, a rapper, uh, Lupe Fiasco, um, uh, is his professional name, um, at MIT. And one of the things he's done working with, uh, uh, Google is to produce not music videos, but, uh, visualizations where everything in the music video is computer generated. Um, so these are some of the ways that, uh, filmmaking and um, uh, not just computer generated text, but uh, computation uh, more generally, and uh, these deep learning systems um, can be implicated in, uh, in filmmaking. Uh, but there's all sorts of ways. So, I mean, 
just another like this is this is not going to amaze anyone, but there's um there's television shows, for instance, that were shot on video. Um uh like the two that I know of are Star Trek series, Star Trek Voyager and Star Trek Deep Space Nine. And now if you watch them on a 4K or even a, a 1080p television, they don't look very good because they were meant for broadcast um, or cable delivery on you know, a, a lower resolution TV. And, um, and you can't remaster them because they're on video. Um, but you can use AI tools to upscale them. <laughs> so you can actually use uh, systems to uh, create like Blu-ray quality version, even though that was that actually never existed. There was no uh, film stock. Uh, it was all shot on lower resolution, lower quality uh, video. So there's another way that computing can work with uh, with uh, restoration and remastering of film. Uh, thank you, Professor Nen, for uh, thank you, Professor Nen, for uh, that fantastic presentation. Just I want to ask you two simple questions. Uh, first, about what makes computer unique in terms of writing style and creativity compared to human works. Yeah. Uh, and the second, are there specific tips? Of stories or themes that computer be uh, generated better than other. Yes. So the uniqueness of uh, computer style and the question of are there certain things in terms of story that computer does better. Um, so uh, computers do mathematical and computational types of writing practices very well. And there are uh, cases in which people have used mathematical methods. So the Ulipo in France was a group of, as still is, a group of mathematicians and writers that came up with a lot of ideas about how mathematical concepts could be applied to writing. And they enacted these ideas uh, as human beings. They did have a group, Alamo, that used computers but they're not really famous for that work. They're famous for the main work that human beings did. Now, this is extended in very different ways when you can use computation and when you can do what a person does um, over the course of an hour or three days, um, you can accomplish that in a, a, a second. And you can extend that process um, and you can do the work of a, of a person. If the person is operating in a very austere, rigid and mathematical way, um, you can do that type of process uh, very, very extensively. You can do what would take a person a decade, just in a moment. Um, so if you define these particular processes, um, then you get these types of non-human writing. You get these types of exploration of language, which I'm interested in. Um, and also I would say the computer is very good at the production of textures. So if you're interested in how language sounds and how there are new types of repetition and phonetic connection that can be achieved, the computer is very powerful for that. So Alison Parrish, who I mentioned, she has a project called Articulations. And it's a very sophisticated uh, method of development. So she extracted all of the lines of verse, all the poetry in the Project Gutenberg corpus. So it's a large, it's a large body of, of literature. And then she built a phonetic model of each line. How does it sound? And then she put each phonetic representation into a vector space. So places that were close to each other, those lines that were close to each other in space sounded similar. And then you can walk through that space and you get similar sounding language. Um, 
And of course, poets are very interested in similar sounding language. That's what the musical aspects of poetry are all about. How can we have alliteration and rhyme and meter and many other aspects of poetry? But this is a non-human way of making sound connections, phonetic connections between text. So it's doing the same thing human beings are interested in when they write poetry, but in a totally different, non-human computational way. And so that to me, Alison Parrish's articulations is a great example of this type of project where it's a concern that people have when they write poems. They want to tie things together and let the sound of language link different lines. But it's also a method that a person would never carry out. It's a computational method. Um, now, with regard to story and what types of stories computers are better at generating, I think story has been much more challenging than work engaging with poetry, which is dominated by form, and even uh, we're able to uh, have access to uh, sound and musicality now, not in the early days, not in the 50s and 60s, but we're able to have access to those aspects, whereas story relies on um, understanding a lot of things about the world. We need to imagine things about the world and um, you know, one of the things about story that makes story powerful is what's called the post hoc propter hoc fallacy. So when we're told two things happen, one after the, the other, John ate a sandwich and then he died. So it's natural for us to assume that John's death was caused by his consumption of the sandwich. It, he, maybe he choked on the sandwich or he was alert. He was really, really allergic to the sandwich. I say that, that one thing happened. They rely on these subtleties. That, that what will you think? Well, what will the reader of this story get a little bit wrong and then later discover will be different. And so these subtleties are very hard to model computationally. So narrative and story is, I think, uh, uh, um, it's more difficult to make um, uh, interesting work to begin with, actually, with the computer. Um, and it requires knowledge of the world. And by the way, the uh, so-called generative AI systems, the chat GPT and the large language models and so on, they don't have any knowledge of the world. They just have knowledge of texts that they've ingested, right? They have the same knowledge of the world that Alison Parrish's articulations does, just a body of text. So, um, so story, uh, there will be interesting work done in story. There already has been, but um, uh, I think that there'll be computer generated poetry that people are uh, in a wide way, many, many readers of poetry will be impressed by before there's a, a novel that uh, readers of will be impressed by. Thank you for uh, your answer. Is there, is there any other question? Thank you so much, Professor. Um, it's really highly appreciated for your valuable insights and information regarding the topic. It's really appreciated. I only have one question, little tiny question regarding the topic yes. and the AI as well. Uh, I have been like into the United States of America as an exchange student lately. I've just been back here to Morocco. And I would love to know your perspective regarding the AI. I noticed a lot of people and students in the United States use the AI. Like you absolutely know that the AI has pros and cons and we do as well. So I just want to know, what do you think 
you know that the AI has a double-edged sword, and I just want to know like its negative effects on the people who use it like in a negative way. And I want to know as well how can we like use it properly in our like in our daily life basis. It's kind of a complicated topic because it, it, it was way, way impressive to me looking at people using AI wherever they go and especially to get done their homework. So I want to really know, like, what do you think about it? Is it like a, a good compared, a good recommendation for you to use the AI? Or we have like, you know, to change it a little bit to do something maybe PDF works or books or whatever. So I just want to know exactly at this point, what do you think about the AI? Do you think we have to use it in our you know, daily yes. every day? And you know, just what are the pros and cons of it? Like, yeah, in general. Yeah. Thank you so much. Well, I'll give you, first of all, my characterization. So I think you're asking, let's be very specific. So chat GPT is what many, many people have had access to, right? So, and it's one particular thing. So first of all, there's there's two lineages of AI. There's symbolic AI. So for instance, Daydreamer, that system that I showed you, and Eliza, those are AI systems. Joseph Weiss Eisenbaum wrote a book about AI, right? But they have no, they don't have learning at all. They don't have a corpus of text. They are rule-based symbolic systems. So there's a whole different strand of AI that still exists, that development is still being done, that people are still doing, that is effective, that, I mean, there's text generation being done. So when people say AI, however, they specifically are talking about deep learning. They, they specifically mean not only the statistical machine learning connectionist branch, but neural nets and specifically deep neural nets and specifically the transformer architecture and specifically pre-trained language models. And, uh, and, and usually they mean corporate models like closed proprietary models, chat GPT. So, so but I also to accept that's not just one in a constellation 70 years. So, so chat GPT, one particular uh, open AI, it's not open, that they just put that in their name so that you would, it's not an open. And I, I also, I don't think it's AI either, but, but that's what the company is called. They want you to believe that it's open and that it's AI. So they put it in their name. Um, uh, chat GPT is chat. I, I agree with that. It's a chat bot. It's a system that is meant to um, respond, but notice that it, it's not called, it's not called write your report GPT. It's not called diagnose your disease GPT. Right, it's called ChatGPT. So why is it called that? Because it's just for entertainment. It's a demonstration. It's a demo. It's not a, a a tool, right? And so I think of you say it's a double-edged sword. So everyone knows. I, I suspect you know Star Wars, right? So I think of. I don't think it's a double-edged sword. I think it's more like a toy lightsaber. Okay, it's 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 something that's flashy. It's fun to use. But it's not a tool at this point. It's not a tool. That's what I would say. Now, it could be a tool. It could be made into a tool for certain purposes. People And, and people use both the text systems and the image systems in inspiration, in you know ideation, in starting to think about uh, new projects. So that's fine. But you can do lots of, I mean, you can just, you know, do an image search in order to like, to. that's how like people who are hunting trends will just look at, you know, what's on Instagram? What are people, that, you know? Um, so there's all sorts of ways you can find inspiration and you can do things and why not chat GPT or these other systems? That's fine. Um, but I think it's actually too much to say that it's a, I don't think it's a sword at all <laughs> with either one edge or two edge at this point, you know? Um, I think more of a toy, it's more of a demo, and it's a very, very impressive demo. But um, if you trust it to diagnose your disease, to tell you, you know, what, what you should do when you have some symptoms, um, 
you're it's very very dangerous so just another you know there's a you know the tesla car has this thing called autopilot it, it, it it's suggesting that it can drive itself right but the tesla car cannot drive itself that's a demo that's that's so if you think that demo is a tool um you might die right that car might crash but and it has happened actually people have died in their tesla cars because they put on the autopilot and then they're like talking to each other and not looking at the road and they've had a crash so it's very the, the real danger here is confusing the demo for the tool um and um it's not the misuse of the tool it's thinking something is a tool when it isn't even a tool at all. Um, so um, I I think that the reason that you can use ChatGPT to write a paper and submit your paper as a student is that the whole system of writing papers and evaluating papers doesn't work. That it's just not a good system. We need to rethink it as teachers, as educators, um, because there's no way that professors, uh, lecturers, instructors, uh, we don't have the time to go over everyone's stuff in detail. So we're gonna not mention that the, you, we're, we're not even gonna notice that the unicorn has one horn here and has four horns over here, right? We don't, need, we don't, we don't know this because we, don't, we ourselves don't have enough attention to read these. Um, so we need to think of a better way um, to ask students to think and write critically um, and to participate um, in engagement and dialogue. Um, but that, that, that's that's my take on 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 the place of, of AI right now, by which we mean chat GPT. I'd say if you want to explore it, and it's worth exploring, but if you really want to explore what a system like chat GPT is, um, I would look at a free large language model that doesn't have all the proprietary instruct GPT, reinforcement learning from human feedback, all those layers on top of it. Um, and it's open. It's not uh, opaque. So you could use GPT Neo X, you could use Bloom, you could use uh, Falcon 40B. There's a bunch of language models that are absolutely free to use. And it does take some time to set them up, but setting them up, uh, and it does take some computer resources. But even this, I have a, I have, I have a writer's. I'm talking to you using this this computer that is not powerful at all. It's a writer's computer. It's not. It doesn't have a graphics card. And I'm running GPT Neo X on this system right here, um, and then text. It takes a long time, but it can do it. Um, so you can use systems like that to try to explore what things do. Um, I understand it's it's easier to do it the corporate way, but you can do it independently also, and um, th that's what I advocate. So, uh, so that uh, it didn't turn out to be a short uh, question after all, but that's my take on AI. <laughs> Let us have a uh, last question. <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor Nick. Uh, it was uh, very interesting to listen to your uh, lecture. Uh, of course, the, the topic you raised is uh, very, very so interesting, uh, talking about, especially today, about AI, uh, or artificial intelligence, and how it uh, has revolutionized uh, all aspects of life. And humanity is not, is not an exception. And here I just want to uh, talk. We were talking about humanities, about uh, art, the, how people produce art. We, we are living again in an age of like named as deep fake. So uh, it gets hard like to uh, distinguish the real from yes. the fake. Uh, and here I would like just uh, you to highlight more about like you know, the difference or uh, between we're talking about electronic or traditional literature and electronic literature. And when we're talking about electronic literature, we may find like uh, numbers that can be 
generated by AI. So to what extent we can consider such works of art that are generated by AI as uh, pieces of art, as worth reading by, uh, let's say, take the example of university that can be taught, I mean, by, uh, at university. So if we can, if, if you can, if we can consider mm -hmm. as, uh, pieces of art, so are they worth teaching, analyzing? Can we get some ins uh, uh, insight yeah. from such type of knowledge? The last uh, question is, because I know I read a bit about some of your works that you are writing, I mean, interactive uh, or electronic uh, novels or interactive uh, uh, fiction. So what's the yes. plus, or what's, uh, can you give us an idea about what's the plus of this type of literature or novels uh, in relation to like the tradition? No. Thank you very much. Yes. Uh, I think I'll take the second question first and mention, you know, I think that interactive uh, fiction um, and interactive literature, I mean, one place that it's very, very alive and that there's very provocative work happening is in computer games. So um, there's a Finnish uh, game studio called Remedy that's making, you know, sort of postmodern metafictional adventure games that are very compelling and very intriguing. Alan Wick uh, recently, the Max Payne series earlier. Um, so, uh, you know, you actually find uh, popular, you know, computer game uh, projects that um, uh, engage with interactive narrative in very compelling ways. Um, and uh, interactive narrative doesn't have to be digital. There's also uh, interactive books like Jason Shiga's comics. So there's, a, I think, a, a you know, a, a still a very vigorous popular life for this work, and it will continue. Um, now, to the question of whether, for instance, an AI-generated novel, and I don't think we have one yet. I don't think we have an AI-generated novel yet. Maybe some work that people have done in collaboration. They generated some text, they put it in, they shaped it. But an actual novel that's just the straight out the output of a computer, you know, I don't think we have that. But could we consider these texts as you know, literary texts that we analyze in literary ways? Well, I, I obviously think so. I, I think it's I think it's important that we do. And let me make an analogy. So I think people are always hesitant about new technologies. So now, nowadays, when we say technology, people know we're talking about computers, but that's not the only technology. Uh, uh, swords are a technology, right? Uh, photography is a technology. Um, and so I, I'm not a cinema studies scholar at all, but I did read this book by Rudolf Arnheim called Film as Art, right? And uh, so Arnheim needed to make the argument that you actually could consider film to be art. Because at that time, people were like, what are you doing? You're just pointing, a, I mean, it's just it's just a record of what's happening you know, in the world. It's, it's not like a painting, it's not like a sculpture. This isn't, this is not art, you know, you, you can't think about cinema that way. And uh, Arnheim needed to point out, oh, well, actually um, there's choice of film stock, there's pointing the camera a certain way, the, the way that you frame things what people do that, you know, I mean, uh, th there's all of these aspects of film that that are uh, directed, there are art, there are things that we can discuss in the framework of aesthetics and art. So yeah, we, we can do the same thing. Talk about computer generated or computer generated books or computer generated poetry. Um, someone wrote the programs or otherwise shaped the software systems that produce those texts. How did they do it? Um, we can ask from one point, what did they want to happen? We can ask from other standpoints. We can say, how does this represent symptomatically the society that they live in? Um, so we can ask all the questions that we ask about um, traditional art or you know, art prior to the computer. Um, of computer art. Um, 
And uh, I think it's the same thing that uh, we went through with film, where people didn't uh, believe at first that uh, you could talk about film um, as art. They had to be persuaded. That argument had to be made. Thank you very much, Dr. Nick Fort. Uh, we in the multidisciplinary faculty of Jose Red feel very happy, pleasant to have you this afternoon and this morning. We hope next time to have you physically to visit this. Oh, uh, thank you. Residence is a very interesting city. It's worth visiting for, uh, you know, international uh, productions were shot here, like Gladiator, uh, Prince yes. of Russia, and so much. So we, we, we are looking forward to invite you physically here in Wazirat to benefit a lot from your insights. Oh, like that would be beautiful. Well, I mean, thank you for having me. Um, I'm glad even through a hole in space to be able to connect with you and speak with you. Thank you very much, Dr. Thank you. All right. Thank you. All right, bye-bye.